So the year that I was born, there was a huge story that rocked the Christian world. There were four missionaries that went down to Ecuador to reach out to a tribe of Indians that had never been reached called the Auca. And these indigenous people actually call themselves the Wadani. But in the, the beginning interactions, there was a misunderstanding and the, the men from those villages came and speared and killed those four men and, and they left their wives and their children wondering what had happened. And the Christian world thought of it as such a tragedy and the secular world thought, what a waste of life. And it was an incredible story of dedication and sacrifice of Jim Elliott and Nate Saint. And as wonderful as that story is about them giving their life, the better stories are what happened as their family particularly kept continuing in love to reach out to this group. And in fact, here is a picture of the, the son of Nate Saint named Steve Saint, and he is with some of the Wadani men. And he went down there and again, was telling them about Jesus and the life they could have in Jesus. And the Wadani tribe has been rated by anthropologists as one of the most violent tribes in the world. There was so much killing of each other and warring with other villages that they had no old men. And it's an incredible story as Steve Saint and Elizabeth Elliot and others continued to reach out to this group of people. And one of the men he developed a friendship with was named Minkaye. And Minkaye and Steve developed this strong friendship. And in fact, Minkaye, he, he decided he wanted to become a, a follower of Jesus. And then later he decided he wanted to become a dentist. And then he was taken outside of his Stone Age culture where they lived on basically subsistence living of killing some animals and having a few things that they, they farmed. And he became a, a spokesperson from the jungles of Ecuador to be what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And somewhere in those travels, he confessed to Steve that he had actually been the one who had thrust the spear into Steve's father. And it's an amazing story about the power of God's grace that, that Steve, whose father was killed, and Minkaye, who thrust the spear into him, could not only become brothers in Christ, but become dear friends. And in fact, this is a, a powerful story about what God can do as we surrender to him. But there's also kind of a funny story that I love that I heard in a, in a documentary as they were making that movie called The End of the Spear. And it talks about when Steve takes Minkaye to a big city, I think it was Chicago, and, and he took him to a huge warehouse grocery store. And they went in there and you can imagine the overwhelmingness of seeing traffic and skyscrapers and then go into this place where there's more food than he could imagine possible. And, and so he, he took that all in, and Steve didn't really know exactly what he thought about it until he got back to Ecuador, and he was telling his friends about this store. And he says to him, you can't believe they have a building bigger than our whole village, and it's full of food. And you get this cart, this basket, and you put all the food in you want, and you get up to the front, and there's somebody that looks at you kind of hard, and they check everything you've got, but they let you go for free, and you get to just walk out of there. And Steve is listening to him tell this story, and he says, well, uh, Minkai, that, that's not quite the whole story. He said, didn't you see that after she put all of the groceries by and checked them, that I, that I took a card out of my wallet, and I gave her that card? And uh, Minkai kind of had a twinkle in his eye, and he said, oh, I saw that, but I saw it. She gave it back to you. And in his mind, as a, a trader and a hunter, Steve had done nothing. And you think of that story, and it just kind of makes you smile, of a Stone Age worldview coming into our modern culture. And you realize he did not understand anything about the process. And he doesn't understand anything about the price. And when we talk about worship, I think it's such an important topic. And I hope to help us bring clarity as you and I work together about what is worship and how do we get better at being genuine worshipers of God? And, and I think this COVID crisis has actually sort of heightened this, an awareness of some of the things that we've used as a part of our worship help. As it's fallen away, it may have revealed some things about our hearts. And so we want to talk about what did Jesus say about worship to begin with? And to find that out, we're going to go to a story in John chapter 4 that takes place in a little tiny village of Samaria, 
last week we talked about Samaritans and the, the animosity that was between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. And so Jesus and his disciples are, are going from Jerusalem back up to Galilee area where they were from. And they have to go through this place called Sychar. And at Sychar, there was a deep well that had been dug by Jacob. So the ancestors, the Jewish ancestors. And, and actually, if you go to Israel today, you, you'll find it. It's not very impressive. You have to go down a couple of flights of stairs in this little village, and it's actually inside of a church, and there's all kinds of, of pictures around it. But the well is still in the same place. And uh, when the woman said it was a deep well, she's right. It's like 130 feet deep. And so that's the setting of the story, but it's not what it looked like in Jesus' day. So if you think of maybe more of a, of a scene where they're walking along and this well is outside of the city of Sychar, and Jesus and his disciples were exhausted and tired, and so Jesus sits down to rest, and his disciples go into the town of Sychar to try to buy some food. And in that setting comes a woman, and she is there at noon, and maybe we are reading a little into it, but usually the women came in the morning or the evening to get water. And I suspect that she was there because she was kind of an outcast. And if you hear a little bit about her lifestyle, you'll understand that. And so then Jesus asks what sounds to us like an innocent question. He says to her, can I have a drink of water? And she startles and she looks at him and she says, why are you talking to me? You are a Jewish man, and I am a Samaritan woman. Those two worlds should never meet. And Jesus leans in with this. I'm going to read in verse 10. And Jesus said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water, running water, water that's flowing. And Jesus, and sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will well up and become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, give me that water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And I think you see the same problem that Steve Saint and Minkaye had, is that Jesus was operating at a much different understanding of who God was and what worship was. And the woman was taking him very literally. And Jesus then switches to a different tact. And a lot of times we look at this passage for how to talk to somebody who's not a believer yet, but we really want to focus on what he says about worship. But Jesus leans into her brokenness and he says, go call your husband and come back. And she said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. And I think we have to be careful. We can't read the tone of voice here, but sometimes I almost hear it read with a snarky tone of voice, like Jesus is condemning her and, and, and maybe pointing out all of her failings. And I think really Jesus is responding with great compassion. He's saying, I, I understand your life, lady. I know that you have been hurt and you have been rejected and you have gone from man to man to man to try to find your life and you have ended up with somebody who's not even your husband and and very likely you're at this well because you have been estranged from everybody in your village. And so as he leaned into her, bro her, her brokenness and her pain, she does what a lot of people do. She throws a smoke screen up and she says, I can see that you're a prophet because <laughs> you're telling me everything I've ever done. Our ancestors, meaning the Samaritans, worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And then Jesus makes these powerful statements about worship. He says, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, listen to this, when true worshipers will worship the Father 
in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Let me, let me go back and think about what are the key points that Jesus is underlining there when he starts to teach this woman and he starts to teach us about what is real worship. And I think the first and most obvious but really important one is that worship is about God, not about me. He, he says there in that he scripture, he says, you understand that the time is coming and now come when true worshipers will worship the Father. And then he goes on and says, in fact, God is seeking for worshipers, that he is in the process of developing relationships with those of us who are lost and estranged and enemies so that we might become worshipers. And we have an incredible tendency, I have an incredible tendency, to make worship about everything else, about the, the atmosphere and about what I like and about all kinds of things. It's, it's easy for me to make worship about me and not about God. And let me just press a little bit because I think COVID-19 has been a test for us. And I, and I hear statements like, well, I can't worship on video or I can't worship with a mask or, or I can't worship if it's not live in the building. And, and maybe even before COVID, we would say, I can't worship if it's not the great songs that I love or if it's not the right volume, or if it's not the right speaker, or if I don't get the right seat. And I guess what I hear us saying is that our ability to worship is really weak, and if we don't get everything set just the way we think it ought to be, I can't worship. And I think that that is a sad and maybe convicting statement about our own hearts. What, is it, what does it take to help prompt us to genuine worship. And I, I think the first point is that it's got to be about God. And I would love to turn this question around. When you come to a worship service, or when you are worshiping in your own home by yourself, or when you are with a group, uh, your life group, or your friends, is it about you and what it makes you feel? Or is it about God? Did, did you ever ask yourself, how does God feel about my worship? And I think even in the Psalms, David said, Lord, may my words be acceptable in your sight. I, I want to worship in a way that, that touches your heart. And you, I, I think this, this picture is that worship starts with God and it ends with God. And I have such a tendency to make it about what it makes me feel when I'm in a certain atmosphere. And feeling is a wonderful part an overflow of worship, but it is not the same as worship. And so he, he says to this woman, you understand that it's about the Father and that the Father is seeking worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. That, that those three aspects of worship, that it's about God, that it's about spirit, and it's about truth. And he gives her these amazing gems of worship to a, to a Samaritan woman who, who does really know very little about any of this. And one of the reasons that the Samaritans and the Jewish people had such an animosity was because of their history. So 700 years earlier, the Assyrians had hauled out all of the people, or many of the people, from the northern kingdom called Israel, the same area where we're talking about. And they had hauled them over to the area of Assyria, or the area near Babylon, and then they had done the same thing with other groups. They felt like if you conquer them and move them out of their homeland, they won't rebel. So they took other people and they moved them into Israel. And they had a picture of God that said God lives in this place, this mountain, this valley. And so when lions came, as, as it tells us the story in Second Kings, uh, they said, we need to find out how to worship the God that lives here. So the king sent a priest, a Jewish priest, back to the Samaritans and taught them about Yahweh, the true God. And they took that worship and then they mixed it with their other gods' worship and they put it together and it became their man-made religion. And so when the Jewish people came back, they, they drew a hard line and said, that is not the worship of the true God. And so that was the beginning of their rejection and their animosity. There, there was one more piece about it. 
And, and it ends up with this second part where Jesus said it's about spirit, not about the physical. That the Father is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, there's an interesting question here about how this should be translated. So I put two versions up here. It says in the NIV, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit, capitalized, and in truth, meaning the Holy Spirit. Well, that's true, but the ESV and many other literal, more literal translations say God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth meaning the kind of way we worship. And in the context of this story, because the, the word for Holy Spirit and spirit, meaning a human spirit, are the same word. It's the context that tells you which it's talking about. And I think in this context, it's really uh, about a small s spirit. And, and what does that mean? It means that he was saying to her, go get your husband. And he was beginning to lean into the, the broken places of her life, and it got uncomfortable for her, so she started a religious argument, one that had been actually going on a long time. She said, it's about where you worship. And she said specifically, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, meaning Mount Gerizim, which was right near the little village of Sychar, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. You see, the... Jewish people and the Samaritans actually had two different copies of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And there are about 6,000 differences, most of them not that great of differences. But one of the huge differences is in the Ten Commandments in the Samaritan Bible, the 11th commandment says the temple must be built on Mount Gerizim, not in Jerusalem, which is like 30 miles away. And so that was like one of the core beliefs of this Samaritan man-made religion that they had. And so she's trying to draw him into a religious argument about do you worship in the temple in Jerusalem, where you Jewish people say, or on Mount Gerizim? I, I find it interesting, and I think you'll find this when you start talking to people about real spiritual stuff, is it's much safer to argue about more peripheral religious issues than it is to talk about the five husbands I had and the man that I'm living with and the hurt and the pain and the, and the fact that I'm arguing about a form of worship when I'm clearly not living in any kind of a godly lifestyle in either Torah. So it wasn't her real issue, but she brought it up. And in that context, that's where Jesus says, it's not about the place. Here's what he said again. Believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know because they had an admixture of foreign religions and we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. So he said, let's be clear, God has given the plan to the Jewish people and Jerusalem is the right place. But he doesn't make a big argument out of it. He just says, you know what? It's really not about the place. And that's where he comes into saying, it's about spirit. And I think when he says we worship in spirit, it, it's echoing the same command that, that we looked at last week when the lawyer said the greatest command of all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And everything that is in me is to be called into play in worship. That I am to be doing it with spirit. And yes, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and with enthusiasm and intent and love and responsive heart, it's to be all of me. And you see, he was speaking in a context where they had reduced religion to rituals in a certain place. And, and in fact, they had, they had the idea that, that the temple was kind of like the house where God lived. And, and they had to go visit him in his house and worship him there. And then they went back to their own house and left God there. You see, they had a very small picture of God and a very local picture of God. And because of that, I think they had such a sense of just rote worship, of just going through the motions. And so it's not about place, because God is everywhere. And you can worship God anywhere. In fact, one of the most powerful pictures 
in Revelation is when all of the people all over the world come together in this beautiful, this beautiful kaleidoscope of languages and clothing and, and music styles and, and ways of worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's, you, worship is universal. It's not in one house in Jerusalem anymore. And Jesus said that time's coming. Actually, it's already here. Is when the Father seeks us to worship him, not in a location, but in spirit wherever we are. And then he goes on, and, he, and we have that sometimes that picture that it's all about a certain activity. And I, I tried to pick a, a stereotypical picture. When we, we think, what is worship? And, and some of us have a, a way in which it has to be like this. It has to be with this song and this volume, and, and I have to be able to put my hands, or, or maybe I'm somebody who's like, I will never put my hands up. But, but it's about the activities, not about the heart. And... Uh, Several years ago, there was a young woman who came to our uh, young adult group at the time, and, and she was the kind of person that you think, oh man, she's going to go far, because she was, first of all, she was very bright, and then she was also very committed to our group, and she would come and engage in the discussion, she would be responsible to help with the functions, and in talking with her and getting to know her better, I found out she has a personal quiet time daily, and in fact, she tithed and was very careful about giving money to, to the church and to other ministries she supported. And, and she talked such a great line. But every now and then there would be something she would say that just kind of in the back of my mind I thought, it sounds like she's talking about true worshipers and herself in different categories. And one day Trina came to Jan and I and she said, I need to tell you something. And this has been after she'd been there like a year she said, I, I've never really accepted Jesus as my Savior. And you know, I, I had suspected that, but I had never had that conversation. And, and we had a great conversation about that. And she didn't tell the rest of the group, and she continued to come. And I actually called her this week to make sure I was telling the story right. And she said that almost a year later, God had been working in her heart. And almost a year later, she had a friend in Germany who was in great distress and she knew that the answer for him was that he would believe in God and trust Jesus with his life. And, and so she booked a flight to Germany with the intent of telling him about Jesus. And all week long she wrestled with, you're talking about it, but you haven't really made a commitment. And she said in the airport, as she was preparing to fly to Germany, she started writing in her journal. And finally she said, Lord, I accept, I believe, I trust you. And she went over there to share with her friend about Jesus. You see, she had all the activities. If you looked at her from the outside, in fact, it's been a warning to me that people can come and they can look very religious and be very sincere and never have surrendered control, never have trusted their life to Christ. They are walking all around the gospel, but it has never really come inside. And I think this woman was talking about religious places and religious activities and Jesus was talking about living water he was talking about something where Jesus invades your soul and he begins to transform you and he says it has to be in spirit and in truth and and I think that's a third piece of what we need to learn about worship is that it's all about God it's about all of my spirit coming to a living spirit the God's spirit and then it's about truth and of course, the one of the truths that he was talking about with this woman was <clears throat> that God has ordained worship and it is in Jerusalem and that is the place he chose. But he also was leaning into the fact that you are thirsty. You have been looking for love from all of these guys and you have never found what you're looking for. And I can give you spiritual life, life that will be like water that you take a drink and, and it not only quenches that thirst that you've been trying to quench everywhere else but it, it wells up in you and it becomes a spring of water it becomes an abundant life it becomes incredibly good news and Jesus is talking at such a level that she doesn't fully understand he says if you knew the gift of God and who asks you for a drink he's talking about himself you would have asked and he would have given you living water and the good news is that this woman did believe him she said I know that when the Messiah comes, he will explain all things to us. 
And, and it, I don't know if you know how incredible this is, but here's a Samaritan woman way off the beaten path. And Jesus is telling her some of the most powerful, clear truths he's been sharing even with the Jewish people and even with his disciples. And he looks at her and he says, I am the Messiah, the one you're talking about. That's me. And you know what she does? She begins to exhibit worship. And I think there's three elements that I want to suggest as we dialogue back and forth that are always a part of worship that is about God, that is in spirit and in truth. And those things are awe and surrender and serving. That when you come to a filling with the living water, that as an outflow, an overflow of your life, comes worship. And I, and I want to just highlight this where I see this in the text. I think you can find it a lot of places. The question she said to Jesus is, are you greater than our father Jacob? I mean, like, he was on the top drawer of their, of their idea of what spiritual people were like in, the, in their setting. The, the Samaritans claimed Jacob as their father as well. And, and she said, are you greater than Jacob? <laughs> What's the answer? Yes, Jesus is. And I think awe has really, it's the answer to that question. And when we come and worship, the question is, God, are you greater than my problems? Are you greater than the COVID crisis? Are you greater than my accusers? Are you greater than the shame of my past? Are you greater? Are you greater? And you think, I, we, th we often have that small picture of God. And let me tell you, a small God does not excite worship. And worship is the fuel of transformation. We often try to come at it backwards, trying to, to behave more like a follower of Jesus instead of becoming more of a worshiper of Jesus. And when you are filled with a love for Jesus and when you come with all of your spirit filled with his spirit, then it results in these things. This is the overflow. And, and, and I think one of the first things is awe, which means a, a wonder. And the Bible talks about having a holy fear an attraction to, but an awesome understanding that, that God is so much bigger than we are and, and that we can't understand even a part of this. And, and I think we, we get what one writer has called awe blind. We take things for granted. We can talk about Jesus dying on the cross and we can talk about the gospel like it's something that happened 2,000 years ago or maybe 20 years in your life. But we don't have a a sense of wonder and a sense of gratitude and a, a, an upwelling of wow, which is a heart of worship. And she said, are you greater than Jacob? And Jesus clearly said, yes. And when you ask him, are you greater than my problems? Are you greater than my frustration? Are you greater than my shame? The answer is yes, yes, yes. And when we come to a true picture of the true God instead of a God of our own making, you see, the Samaritans had taken some of the worship of God and some of the worship of all the other idols and they'd mixed it together. And we say, how could they do that? And I say, we do the, exactly the same thing. We often have all kinds of ways in which we look at God at least partially, if not incorrectly. And part of our study and reading of the scriptures is to get a clearer and more wonderful view of who Jesus is and who God is. And so it, it happens that it brought her to awe. And then let me show you a couple of verses about a couple other places where you see this. It says, leaving her water jar, meaning she's coming back, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? I think maybe some of them came back to find out what he had told her she ever did. But she was saying, I think I found the Messiah. Can you imagine a more unlikely person to bring the gospel to this village I mean it's a small town everybody knows her business and she comes and she says I think I found the Messiah and in her awe and in her enthusiasm they come back and a whole troop of them come back and Jesus teaches them and talks to them and and then he actually goes to their village which is unheard of for a Jewish rabbi to go stay in a village of Samaria and after that they say and because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. 
Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I mean, this is an incredible story in a Jewish group that were so hard-hearted and resistant, and here this group of mixed man-made religion Samaritans, and they hear and they respond and they believe and they become this incredible place where Jesus is acknowledged as the Savior of the world. And I think those things I mentioned to you earlier are clearly shown here, that they came with a sense of awe. This is the Messiah. This, this is the Savior of the world. And they come with a sense of surrender. They say, we don't just believe because you told us. We now believe because we have come to see this for ourselves. And I think even as you see, the, they want him to stay and to teach them more. And, and even the, the first thing that that woman does when she, when she really finds out who Jesus is, is it says she, she wants to serve. She, she wants to run back and tell people. And we've been wrestling with a, a great question recently. Uh, one of the authors that we're reading says, do you see Jesus' story as good news? Because if you see it as good news, if you understand how good the good news is, your overflow will mean you want to tell it. You want to, you want to talk about Jesus and you want to talk about the gospel. And I think what a, what a powerful picture that is, again, in Jesus' words, they, they offer him food that they've gotten in the village and the disciples say, here's lunch. And he says, no thanks. And they're like, what? And he, and he has this great line. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. See, when, when we are caught up in being like Jesus, then that serving of God is satisfying something so much deeper than food is that when we take in the living water, that our overflow is to worship God and to surrender our lives and to, to want to serve, not out of a sense of obligation, but out of a sense of gratitude and wonder and, and appreciation. And if the worship in your life isn't like that, then I invite you to be on a journey with us as we learn more about how, what helps us worship. We had, we had a staff discussion of what helps you worship in spirit and in truth. And, and it's not exactly the same answer for everyone. I mean, the scripture is always part of it and usually quiet and solitude. And there are several aspects. In fact, in this book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality that we're going through, he talks about probably a term that you're not familiar with called daily office which simply is carving out a couple of times in the process of your day to stop. And he actually talks about it means that you have to stop. It means that you have to center, which means getting your, your mind open and focused on God. And that there has to be silence. And then there has to be scripture. And he, he challenges us to begin to put into our schedule. And so the, the graphic we're using for worship has all kinds of different people in different occupations and different roles. Because when we talk about worship, I don't want you to think about one hour at church on a weekend or one hour watching on video. I want you to think about worship in your whole life. Because worship needs to encompass our whole life and it's the fuel for transformation. And you know, as I was telling the story of Minkaye and how God took him from a, a killer of missionaries to a proclaimer of the gospel all over the world, literally. And this year, he passed away in his own little village in Ecuador. And you know, he's somewhat of an anomaly from that culture because they had no old men and you didn't die of natural causes. And he not only lived a life filled with the living water and spread that to many others, he died in his own place as an old man having run the race and I think what a powerful picture of how worship changes a life. And it changed Menkaye's life, it changed Steve Saint's life, and the millions of people that have heard them. So I hope that this discussion helps you learn more about how to be a worshiper in spirit and in truth. We're going to hand off to the campuses, and your campus pastors are going to give you a discussion question, or if you're online or in South County, Jason will just share that with you.